Thank you very much. Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Chancellor of the Judiciary, Honorable Prime Minister, and Leader of Government Business, Honorable Vice President, Honorable Members of the National Assembly, Your Excellencies of the Diplomatic Community, the Honorable Chief Justice, Chief of Staff, Commissioner of Police, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. The eyes of the people of Guyana are upon us, all of us, me as president, ministers of the government, and you, the members of the National Assembly, from every political party here represented. The people of Guyana are waiting to see what we'll do with their affairs. Will we serve their interests faithfully, every one of them, regardless of race or creed? Will we deliver the good governance and accountability each of us, each political party promised? Will we strive to make their lives better, as all of us pledge to do? For me, our nation stands at a crossroad in its history, particularly after we endured an alarming period of uncertainty when our democracy was threatened at home and place of respect was imperiled abroad. The path before us, as already embraced by my government, is to lead to a better Guyana where its bountiful potential will be realized, and from whose bounty we ensure every Guyanese benefit. For me, as the ninth executive president of our beloved nation, there is no doubt of the path my government and I have chosen. It is a path that celebrates the collective wisdom, strength, and character of our Guyanese people. The very people who stood up fearlessly in defense of democracy. The very people who have sacrificed much in bringing our country together, regardless of race or political persuasion. For those who choose an alternate path, you too will be held accountable. But I assure you, such a part brings nothing or adds nothing to the Guyana we want to build. All of us gathered here today are summoned by the spirits of our ancestors who labored in its cause. Their voices have called us from the depths of our nation's past to govern this land at an extraordinary time of our people's history. And those summons, those calls, have not been made to the government representatives alone. They have been made to all who serve in a National Assembly as representatives of the people, regardless of their party political support. The people of this nation elected the parties represented in the Assembly. They want us to be partners in serving the country, not adversaries in pulling it apart. That is not to say that they did not expect us to disagree or that they did not anticipate that you would differ, but they do not expect us to differ at their expense or to disagree to their detriment. They put us all here in the same ship of state they express us to navigate it through calm seas and turbulent waters alike, and to take them to a heaven of progress, prosperity, and peace. To do so calls for political maturity that puts at all times the national interests and the people's welfare above all else. The success of our nation depends on it. None of us should let our nation down. 
In the words of our national poet, Martin Carter, and I quote, like a jig shakes a loom, like a web is spun the pattern, all are involved, all are consumed. Our most acute challenge is a national emergency we face, tackling the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic. The coronavirus has taken a toll on our economy, substantially reducing the projected growth in our gross domestic product forecast by the international financial institutions for this year. In human terms, the immediate economic impact of the pandemic, which necessitated the closure of our borders and the shuttering of many businesses, is a hardship that has been visited on the most vulnerable in our society. The elderly, single mothers, and children are the worst affected. Their situation demands our immediate and intense attention. They have suffered for too long already. And my government is determined to move decisively to improve their condition. I assure you, no resources will be spared in this effort. But it is as a public health emergency that the silent cruelty of the fearsome disease has been most brutal. The consequence is that so far, we have endured the anguish of 8,023 confirmed cases and suffered the loss of 181 lives. All of those lives mattered. Some of them would have been the sole breadwinners in families, now left to struggle, not only with the pain of their loss, but with the strain of no livelihood. And that is why tackling COVID-19 is my government's most pressing priority. Safeguarding the health of all must be our highest priority. Amongst the actions we took is the mobilization of regional, national, and international support while supporting the livelihoods of families with direct cash and food transfers. We also implemented various measures through the central bank to help small and medium-sized businesses, in particular, to cope with the economic fallout of the pandemic. We have supported frontline workers, our children's education, and created an innovative environment for economy and governance systems to continue. Whilst we continue our fight to contain the virus, we are aggressively pursuing every avenue that will lead to the complete vaccination of our population by the end of the year. I assure you, no resource will be spared in this effort. I remind this parliament that our nation suffered five long months of fear, anxiety, and nervousness. Waiting for the results of general elections, a circumstance caused by those who put themselves above the law, and their political, political greed over the well-being of the people. In all that time, no budget was presented for consent, no borrowing was authorized, and no spending approved. In defiance of the law and the rulings of the highest courts of this land, the previous administration arrogated power unto itself, spending the taxpayers' money with no authority and no legitimacy. This must never occur in Guyana again. That is why constitutional reform to guarantee a democratic Guyana will receive priority attention based on a national consultative process. My government will introduce in the National Assembly a bill to authorize such a consultative process by an independent body. Lawlessness must never be tolerated in Guyana again. Contempt for the people must never, ever be allowed in Guyana again. Over the last months, feverish and difficult work 
has been undertaken to put, the National put before the National Assembly a full budget to address the myriad challenges that confront the nation. Since its installation, my government has encountered huge issues of transparency and accountability, of cronyism, of waste, and of fraud. Unemployment is much higher than the nation was led to believe. To fix this grim situation, we need to move now, and we need to move swiftly. We are faced with what Barack Obama described as the urgency of now. We want our factories humming with production. We want our people back at work. We want our businesses turning profits and investing in new and expanded enterprises. We want a Guyana that rises like the fabled phoenix from the ashes of neglect, spreading its wings and soaring proudly to the heights that should long ago have been a sport. And we want every Guyanese to be part of that rising, sharing its transformation and its resultant benefits. This is no young man's dream, nor is it an old man's vision. It is a reality within our gaps as a nation. And we need it, and we need what we need is the will to seize it together. And that is what I invite every Guyanese, every man, every woman, every child to do. As the president of Guyana and the head of government, my credo and the credo of this government and the credo of this government is nation building. The key word of my government is oneness. The essential character of my government vision is inclusion. Stop being defined by race. Stop being defined by politics. Start being defined by our one nationality and by our common love for our one country. Let us lift it up together. And by doing so, let us lift each other and ourselves, one people, one nation, one destiny. I propose to give meaning to my call for one Guyana by requesting the leader of government business in the National Assembly, Prime Minister Brigadier the Honorable Mark Phillips, to introduce the adoption of an act of parliament establishing a one Guyana commission which he will head. As the great philosopher C.L.R. James put it, and I quote, a nation is built not on abstraction, but on tackling and solving the problems which occupy its people. The purpose of the commission should be to try to do just that in relation to the practical steps we can take to cement our one society, encompassing and respecting the diversity from which our oneness springs. The work of the commission, commission would be countrywide, and it would listen to the free expressions of all voices concerning ways in which every Guyanese can honor their ancestral heritage while giving the highest regard to our blended Guyanese civilization. Among the matters which it would address includes education concerning our history, our religions, how we ensure equal opportunities for education, employment and entrepreneurship, and institutional strengthening of the existing Ethnic Relations Commission to make it more effective. In all of this, we must be guided by the wisdom of Nelson Mandela that, and I quote, no man is born hating another person because of the color of the skin, or his background, or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite, end of quote. We must move our nation building from abstraction to action and lose not one more moment in doing it. Let us stand up for our one nation, our one Guyana. Let us stand up for what we know in our hearts and in our minds to be right. Let us stand up for one identity, the Guyanese identity. I say a special word about our Amerindian Guyanese community, the forest people of our nation. They and their ancestors have been in Guyana and of Guyana longer than any other community in our society. 
throughout the lands of what is now the Americas, from Canada in the north to Argentina in the south. The indigenous people suffered historic injustices, including colonization by European nations, dispossession of their lands, and prevention from developing in accordance with their particular needs and interests. In our one Guyana, the Amerindian community occupy a special place as our forest people. This is a circumstance we must never forget and must always honor. They deserve the respect of all of us for in their indigenous knowledge, culture, and traditional practices that contribute to the sustainable development and informed management of the environment that we all share and from which we all benefit. Over the next five years, while my government is tasked with the responsibility of man managing our country's affairs, we are determined to improve the lives of our Amerindian Guyanese communities through, through a range of measures that we'll implement. These include updating the Amerindian Act after consultation with every Amerindian community, as well as improving education, health facilities, housing, and infrastructure development in the areas in which they live. The culture of the Amerindian Guyanese is a golden thread in the rich tapestry of the common civilization that we have collectively fashioned for almost two centuries. All of us should be proud of it, treasure it, and celebrate it. We must do all in our power to strengthen their status and their contribution, thereby enhancing not only their community, but our one nation to which each group is integral and from which no group is divisible. Mr. Speaker, honorable members of the National Assembly, we are at an unprecedented time in our nation's history. We stand together in the cups of what could be a new economic era of prosperity in which all will share now and from which future generations will benefit. But let us not fool ourselves that this new economic era will happen without our collective effort, that it will happen without our national unity, that will, it will happen despite ourselves. There has never been a greater moment when we as Guyanese need to stand as one to secure the benefits of our natural resources and to protect our sovereignty, the right to make decisions in our national interests and our territorial integrity. Regarding our territorial integrity, the threat from our neighbor Venezuela has not receded simply because the International Court of Justice has ruled that it has jurisdiction in the matter and is proceeding to adjudicate the merits of the case before it on the Guyana-Venezuela contention, Guyanese-Venezuelan contention. We all know that recently, Guyanese fishermen were arbitrarily arrested and detained by the Venezuelan military while they were operating in waters of Guyana's exclusive economic zone. This demonstrates that the threat is an ever-present danger, even as we pursue a path of settlement by peaceful means through international law. In respect of our sovereignty, the right to make decisions in our national interests while the prospect for wealth from oil and gas is now real, it could dissipate if we fail to take the necessary steps to ensure that Guyana's interests and its rightful income are safeguarded. Our nation is dealing, for the most part, with giant companies in the oil and gas industry. This is uncharted territory for us, but we will have to map the way that leads to the best circumstances for our country. For sure, we will need expert advice based on some knowledge and robust experience of the industry, including operating agreements, concessions, laws, and regulations to promote good governance and prudent management of the oil and gas sector to make sure our people benefit. But above all else, we need every Guyanese united as one to stand in defense of our rights and entitlement. Guyana's sovereignty and territorial integrity must be the nation's constant unified watch. It is this patriotic duty 
Every Guyanese must stand up to be, and be counted. Every political party, every trade union, every business organization must stand up and be counted. This National Assembly must stand up and be counted. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. My government wants a cooperative partnership with the companies now licensed to operate in the oil and gas sector of our economy. Leaving oil and gas in the ground is not an option. It cannot be an option when their production and sales can transform the economy of Guyana, bringing in considerable revenues that, we, that can be utilized to dramatically improve the lives of all our people. We must also acknowledge that we cannot take advantage of our oil and gas resources without the considerable investment of the companies now operating in the sector. They're entitled to a fair return on their investment. Therefore, our relationship should be based on fairness, on equity, and on mutual interests. That is the goal to which the government will work to ensure future production contracts resound to the significant benefit of Guyanese without seeking to disincentivize foreign investment. To support government in managing of the oil and gas sector, we will be pursuing various legislative and institutional initiatives. Update to the Petroleum Act, building the capacity and an institutional framework for the audit of expenditure and the drafting of a new production agreement with international standards under which any new production license will fall. But even as I look forward to the establishment of the Petroleum Commission, my government will introduce legislation for consideration by this session of the National Assembly. One of the pieces of legislation will be to fortify the, in law the local content policy which is currently undergoing the phase of public consultation. <clears throat> the aim is not only to align the policy with international best practices, particularly regarding reporting and transparency, but also to deliver more business and more jobs to our people. The legislation will be drafted based on the outcome of consultations that I will hold with stakeholders in our society concerning provisions in the law that would best serve our national interests. Guyanese must not be second-class citizens in the oil and gas sector in our own country. They must be its principal beneficiaries, ahead of all and second to none. Thousands of Guyanese will be trained at every level to create a national core of managers and technicians to effectively administer the sector. For the benefit of this generation of Guyanese and those yet unborn, we will establish an arms length sovereign wealth fund insulated from political interference. Legislation will be enacted to define how finances will flow from the fund into the budget and the purpose for which they will be used. <clears throat> My government also intends to come to the nation for every cent earned from the industry and for every cent that is spent. <laughs> to accomplish this, legislation will be introduced during this session of the National Assembly, making the Finance Minister and the Finance Secretary responsible for publishing details of all revenue and expenditure in the official gazette, allowing the people to track all transactions. Failure to do so will be punished severely under the law. The revenues from the sector, like all other sectors, are the people's money. They're entitled to know how much money is earned, how much money is spent, and on what it is spent. I've also made it clear to my ministers that transparency and accountability are the fundamental principles by which I expect them and myself to conduct ourselves and to which I hold them accountable. We are the custodians of the people's asset and will account to them for all that we do. That is why we'll also establish a regulatory framework that is independent of politicians, and why we'll build strong national capability to hold oil companies accountable and to verify production and other expenditures. 
Mr. Speaker, honorable members of the National Assembly, let me be clear on something. On something else. My government does not intend to allow the oil and gas sector to encourage what is called Dutch disease, which dominates all other sectors of the economy and diminishes them in value and sustainability. Our country must not suffer the fate of other nations that came to depend on oil and gas so substantially that they face ruin when the sector floundered, contracted, or diminished. Revenues from the oil and gas resources must be used to strengthen the agriculture, mining, manufacturing, and services sector to make them globally competitive so that Guyana can be a resilient nation now and in the future. And that brings me, Mr. Speaker, to the manifesto which my party presented to our nation at the March 2nd general and regional elections. Our manifesto is a statement of my government's ambition for our country. It is an ambition we shall aim to fulfill. Like all ambitions, we shall have to mold it to life's changeable realities, to the realities of Guyana as impacted by the world of which we are a part. It is a path we shall follow in fulfillment of our dream for Guyana. There will be times when we pause to check our bearings, times when our bearings call for variable tracks, but our goals will be constant and our promises secure. We shall do so over the life of the government. Fulfillment cannot be instant in all matters. Some will be delayed by circumstances, but you will have no cause to doubt or resolve to keep our promises. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, without going into the detail of every pledge in our manifesto, which remains publicly available on the internet, my government has strived to honor in our period in office every aspect, every promise, every commitment. Let me mention here a few that must command immediate attention. We, stand quite, we stated quite clearly that our objective is to create 50,000 jobs. That goal, which once seemed distant and impossible, is now within our nation's reach, made possible, possible by the transformative agenda of government that will see the expansion of construction, investment in mega-scale infrastructure, reduce costs of energy, leading to industrialization and upscale agro-processing and manufacturing, environmental services, engineering services, and a spin-off of major private sector investments in new hotels and shore-based facilities. The area of logistics and energy security would also see massive investments and opportunities. These supported by the revitalization of our, of our agriculture sector, support of mining, and expansion in quarrying will pave the way for job creation. Even with adequate shipping facilities, we already supply, even with inadequate shipping facilities, we already supply fish, vegetables, and fruit to regional markets, and even further afield to our diaspora communities in the US, Canada, and the United Kingdom. An example of the market opportunities available to increase agriculture and fisheries production is that last year, the countries of the Caribbean community imported more than US 5 billion worth of food. This, is a, this gave every reason why our farmers, including our rice farmers, should seek a significant share of that market. Therefore, my government will give every assistance to farmers by improving drainage and irrigation, by incentivizing young people to pursue farming as profitable careers, providing concessions for large-scale farming, removal of vat and machinery, equipment, fertilizer and pesticides, and providing grants and a support system for small farmers. We intend to do the same for fisheries 
manufacturing and forestry, by providing incentives, concessions, and support. We want our farmers, fisher folk, miners, and livestock growers to think globally as they develop and increase their production and the marketing of their products. My government is committed to providing the infrastructural framework in which these enterprises can develop and expand, improving directly the lives of all who invest their efforts in them and benefiting our country as a whole indirectly by increasing its wealth, its wealth and the welfare of our people. Mr. Speaker, I say a special word about sugar. Sugar is more to us as a people than a mere agricultural crop. In a real sense, it represents our beginnings as a Guyanese nation. Yes, our ancestors were brought from different lands to the place of our forest people, the Amerindian Guyanese. But sugar was the start of the fashioning of our identity as Guyanese and our struggle as one people to end colonialism and exploitation and to take control of our destiny. Dr. Shadi Jagan once observed that both Afro-Guyanese and Indo-Guyanese watered the sugarcane fields with their blood. We should all ponder that thought. Those sugarcane fields in which our ancestors toiled and in which their blood was shed represents the shared exploitation of our people. Well, the blood, sweat, and tears of our people should never again water fields for any exploiter. In the words of the Jamaican-American poet, Claude McKay, and I quote, if we must die, let it not be like hogs, haunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while wrung us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, Oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may, be shed, may not be shed in vain. All of this is why we Guyanese must resolve to nurture and care for what we have built together and never allow the circumstances arise where we dilute our oneness or weaken our one Guyana. Sugar symbolizes all that. But even more, Sugar still has every possibility of continuing to provide jobs, revenues, and modern skills to our people while providing them with dignity. In resuscitating the industry, I've already directed a detailed revitalization plan for every estate, whilst we are examining possible private investment to support the diversification, expansion, and modernization of the industry leading to sustainability and economic viability. Mr. Speaker, every Guyanese aspires to a better quality of life. Each of us want a home, reliable electricity, water when we turn on the taps, education for our children, health facilities, and a job that will allow us to pay for those things. That is why job creation is at the top of my government's priority. But we recognize that while we create the conditions for more jobs and better incomes, these are, there are immediate steps that must be taken to improve the living conditions for all. That is why we have removed VAT on electricity, water, medicines, and certain food items. That is also why we'll upgrade health facilities across the country including expansion of diagnostic services, such as CT scans, ultrasound, and echocardi echocardiogram at key regional hospitals, as well as improved ambulance services. We will also focus major investments to address issues of mental health, reproductive health, and invest in a state-of-the-art maternity and children's hospital. We'll also create the enabling environment to drive private investment in healthcare, thus making Guyana a regional and international hub for health services. We'll, we will also ensure 
that has adequate supply of pharmaceuticals and medical supplies, with a focus on timely procurement, proper storage, and reliable delivery to hospitals and health centers. Very aware that our medical practitioners, doctors, and nurses are in the front line of maintaining the health of our people, particularly now. We intend to improve conditions of services and re remuneration for healthcare workers generally. And let me take this opportunity at this parliament, the highest decision-making body of our nation, to express publicly our deepest appreciation and gratitude to the medical personnel, personnel who have risked their own health to help our nations in the battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. Even as I note that the battle is far, far from over and more will be expected of them, I thank them most sincerely on behalf of a grateful nation. And I call on all here gathered to applaud their effort with respect. As a nation, we will not be judged only by the way we treat human beings, but we must also pay particular attention to the environment, our natural heritage, and the way we treat animals. My government will support initiatives and invest in programs that address all these issues, sometimes referred to as soft issues, but which importantly adds to the story of who we are as Guyanese. Mr. Speaker, Guyana is blessed with an abundance of natural resources that provides opportunities for every Guyanese. Few other countries in the world can boast of being home to gold, diamond, bauxite, sugar, rice, cattle, and other livestock, forestry, oil and gas, abundant agricultural lands, fresh water, and tourism. There is no reason for a country to be poor or for our people to want. We together have to take all of these natural resources that have been gifted to us and turn them, turn them into national treasure. My government intends to lay down the infrastructure that will result in the full utilization of these resources. Mr. Speaker, I do not wish to preempt the budget that will be presented to the National Assembly in a few hours. Our development plan will be set out in granular details in the budget. However, I give the Honorable House and the Guyanese public insights into elements of our development plan, including some of what we are doing and why we are doing them. We plan to expand our road system across the country including community roads and hinterland roads. We'll also build a bypass road with connections to Mocha, Eccles, and the Demar Harbor Bridge. We'll initiate work on several transformative infrastructural projects that will take years to complete, but we'll start them. They'll include the Deepwater Harbor in Barbies, support the shore-based facilities, support the private investment that will see new branded hotels, support agriculture, that will see mega investments in, in large-scale agriculture, opening up of new lands through the construction of farm-to-market access roads, commencement of the Linden to Latham Road, four-lane highway from Georgetown to Tamari, commencement of the Parika to Goshen Road link to Bartika, upgrade and development of new all-terrain roads links from Tamari to Bartika, upgrade of regional airports and building of new ferries. The construction of a four-lane link between Mandel and Diamond with interconnection to the existing highways to reduce travel time. Completion of the new Damra River Bridge. The construction of a new superhighway from Schoonar to Purika. We are working with our neighbor Suriname to establish a quarantine river bridge, which would have great benefits for the private sector in enlarging markets, expanding the scale of business, and increasing employment. Mr. Speaker, we are very conscious of the rich but fragile environment with which we have been endowed by nature. As promised in our manifesto, the government will reinstitute an expanded low-carbon development strategy. The strategy, as it is, 
at, it is now, as it is now, will be broadened to include wider environmental services, water resources management, climate resilience, biodiversity, renewable energy, and the marine economy. We believe that this strategy will allow Guyana to earn substantial revenue that can be utilized to diversify the economy and create employment opportunities for our people, as we did previously under the Norway Agreement. In this agreement, we can earn hundreds of millions of U.S. dollars as we, have, as we have established in our earlier arrangement with the Norwegian. From this agreement, we seek to ensure the creation of new clean jobs. We also intend for the benefits from the payment of ecosystem services to flow to all Guyanese, especially our indigenous communities where forest prior informed consent principles and the opt-in mechanism should strictly be observed. The expanded LCDS will also include the establishment of an international center of excellence for biological diversity with objective of promoting cutting edge research and developing and exporting educational services. The national strategy will also seek to strengthen the institutional mandate of the Environmental Protection Agency by providing an empowering regulatory framework to guide economic growth initiatives. This also means that the national system of protected areas will also be strengthened and expanded in accordance with international standards of environmental integrity. Finally, the expanded LCDS will provide opportunities to our people by creating avenues that will provide grants for startup businesses of a renewable energy nature. Beyond the management of our natural resources, the expanded LCDS will, will also ensure the increase of land management and access to land is addressed. This will be done by the establishment of a formal interagency mechanism with intention to coordinate among key sectors to address various land use conflicts in Guyana via the implementation of the land use policy. The implementation of this policy is also expected to be implemented with a regional dimension that will ensure to incorporate the interests of both residential and commercial users. The expanded LCDS will guide our developmental trajectory along an inclusive, low carbon, sustainable, clean, resilient path with increased economic opportunities and investment linked to greater social and infrastructural development for the benefit of all. Mr. Speaker, beyond the richness of our natural resources, Guyana has no greater wealth than its people. We recognize that human capital development is crucial for inclusive economic growth and transformation. And it is the responsibility of government to ensure that its people are prepared for this change. Therefore, my government will ensure that all Guyanese are equipped for transformation in the economy by identifying employment intensive sectors and ensuring that our people are trained to enable them to meet the demand of these sectors. Investing in Guyanese is not only good for economy, but has broader equity and welfare implications. With rapid change in technology, we recognize that investing in our people is pivotal. Our move towards knowledge-intensive industries will also enable greater participation from female Guyanese and help to reduce the gender gap in our society. These fields are expected to see higher future demand as our economy continues along its diversification path and will be supported by the 20,000 scholarship programs, expansion improvement in educational facilities, expansion and use of ICT in education, enhancement of opportunities in technical vocational education, curricular reform, establishment of an online university to promote e-learning, and provision of textbooks to our school children, among other things. 
The drive towards diversification and sustainable employment requires a vibrant private sector to absorb labor and, labor and a labor market that allows flexibility, skill building, and reasonable compensation. My government will continue to work with the private sector, recognizing that they're the backbone of any economy. Our local companies must be given a level platform to compete. Training and capacity building initiatives, along with the transfer of skills and technology, are important to this process. We're cognizant that there are imp impediments to businesses, providing goods and services to the oil and gas sector, especially in the area of finance and cost optimization. My government will ensure that our regulatory frameworks are conducive for local companies that work in this sector so that they can garner the necessary resources needed to take advantage of these new opportunities. Our economy is changing, and we have to ensure that our policies are flexible and fit for purpose. These incentives will ensure that our Guyanese people continue to prosper and truly benefit from the oil and gas sector. It is our firm belief that the Guyanese people are the greatest asset that the nation possesses. In supporting the new economy, my government understands the necessity of developing skills in emerging areas such as oil and gas, agro-processing, industrialization, manufacturing, climate change, environmental services, biodiversity, sustainable tourism management, and aquaculture, whilst at the same time strengthening our capacity in the traditional sectors with the aim of making them more productive and competitive. Mr. Speaker, our potential to become a major player in the energy market <clears throat> is not only limited to our borders, but we've already commenced discussion with our neighbors, Brazil and Suriname, in the establishment of an energy corridor. Guyana's energy security will be driven by an energy mix that will see solar, wind, hydro, natural gas, all being key components in making us the energy capital of the region. This, of course, will see tremendous investment in manufacturing and industrial development that, we, that will be supported by the Gas to Shore project, the natural gas plant, and the establishment of the Wales Development Authority. We have already received numerous proposals from major manufacturers looking at, at Guyana as their next investment destination. To support the growing demand and potential for commodity training, trading, government will be establishing free zones to facilitate trade and open up new opportunities. These investments will also see the expansion of the hinterland electrification program and the development of microgrids for large hinterland villages for off-grid areas. Mr. Speaker, no country or society can progress without the safety and security of its people. We have committed to the reform of the security sector, the update of laws, strengthening of capacity, and building institutions that will support our plans and programs for safer communities and country. We have already commenced tackling crime with the involvement of people. To this end, we're strengthening community policing, intelligence services, and widening focus on making existing institutions stronger. We're investing in new and appropriate technologies, providing tools and equipment to allow for better response to crime and more proactive policing. Whilst at the same time, we're working on the improvement of welfare and conditions of service for our men and women in uniform. Critical to the strategic approach to crime fighting is the strengthening of the regionalized structure of the Guyanese poli Guyana police force. Greater integration with interest groups and stakeholders at the regional level will be facilitated to improve accountability and transparency in crime fighting. We'll also be strengthening our ability to secure our borders with the establishment of a border patrol unit Special legislation is being drafted to give effect to this. 
Mr. Speaker, when my government's budget 2021 is presented to the National Assembly, and when my ministers contribute to the debate, greater details will be provided on the implementation of our manifesto pledges, covering more aspects than I have mentioned in this address. However, I want to speak myself on the matter of partnerships between government and representative bodies in the governance of our one Guyana. The watchword for the governance of our country must be partnership. I propose to have regular high-level consultations with the representatives of the private sector, the trade unions, religious bodies, and other civil society groups to address key issues that confront our nation. I intend also to directly engage communities and community leaders across every village in building trust and deepening relationship to the benefit of the people of those communities. And I propose to do this personally, leading this personally. Every village, every community, we will build trust, we will win hearts, and we will develop in the interest of the people of this country. With these representatives, it is my desire that consensus will be formed on how to tackle these issues effectively. I've encouraged my ministers to establish similar consultative machinery so that in making decisions, government can be advised by the best brains and talent in every area of our national endeavor. And the hand of partnership will be extended to the Guyanese diaspora. It is my intention to enhance the oversight of diaspora affairs so that we can maintain meaningful links to the diaspora and for convening meetings with their organizations. In this connection, we're in the process of establishing a diaspora council to engage the government in a structured and regular manner. Our diaspora is a source of investment, of talent, and of knowledge, all of which can benefit our nation. They can also be an important influential body in the countries where they have made their second homes for promoting the interests of Guyana. Mr. Speaker, all must be involved. All must be consumed. Mr. Speaker, my government understands the importance of youths in development of the country. It is for this reason I have established the soon to be operationalized Youth Advisory Council, which will be at the heartbeat of policy making. Our support for young people will go beyond education, health, and sports. We'll be establishing a special development, innovation, and research fund to stimulate new business ideas and to create a space for youth participation in the new economy. Young people can expect investments in every region that will give access to state-of-the-art sporting facilities and, importantly, incentivizing participation in the creative industry. Our support to cultural development and the creative industry will be critically linked to our tourism and hospitality sector. Home ownership for young people with support from the banking sector is also a top priority for my government. Mr. Speaker, all of which I spoke is dependent on the institutions, systems, and various arms of government, understanding their distinct role in the common future for our country. Whilst the arms of government are separate, they must all assess the direction of the country and build the relevant institutional capacity to meet the demands of the future. This of, this, of course, requires training, retraining, retooling, and expansion of the existing framework in which they operate. To support this, my government will unfold a legislative agenda that will create the statutory and legal foundation on which a new and modern Guyana will rest. This will require the modernization of archaic laws 
an introduction of a new set of laws to reflect the changing nature of our new economy. However, the legislative agenda must be people-focused, making it easier and less costly to do business, whilst at the same time creating a more efficient and affordable system to give justice to the ordinary man. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I wish to share just a few, just a few targets my government will pursue over the next five years in key areas. We believe that we must be held accountable. And in holding us accountable, you must know where your country is going. You must know the targets. Therefore, I wish to share just a few of those targets. In the area of energy, we propose to have the development of a world-class energy mix. Installation of 400 megawatts of new installed capacity, inclusive of hydropower, solar, wind, and natural gas. Reduction of electricity costs for households and businesses. Making Guyana's energy costs globally competitive. Working with Brazil and Suriname to create a new energy corridor and outlining a clear path to become a net energy exporter. In the area of the environment, we'll be adopting the expanded LCDS as our national development framework to create opportunities to tap into and earn hundreds of millions of US dollars through the sale of environmental services. Our Vice President will be leading these efforts. Much has already started, and we are confident about the returns that can come to Ghana. We did it before, and we will do it again. Establishing a world-class biodiversity center, pursuing opportunities for payment of ecosystem services, incentivize good environmental performance in the private sector. The private sector also have a role, and we are going to support them in that role. In the area of infrastructure transformation, opening up of hundreds of thousands of acres of agriculture lands through the investment in farm-to-market roads and drainage and irrigation systems. New superhighways on West Demrara, East Coast and East Bank corridors, a new Demrara River Bridge crossing. Support private investment in new hotels, adding at least 2,000 more rooms to our stock. Creating an environment to make Guyana a major logistics hub New shore base and harbor facilities supported by government policies and planning. Investment in new ferries and capital drainage, capital drainage equipment to improve efficiency of our ports. You know, one of the major difficulties of our port is the dredging of the Demra River and is it has caused our ports to become very inefficient. We are going to invest in the capital equipment to resolve this issue and make our ports viable, sustainable, and operate at an optimal manner. Commencement of the Linden to Latem Road Highway, creating an infrastructure that will see more investment in agro-processing and manufacturing supported by a ballooning of engineering services. Creation of new road networks in the hinterland and rivering communities. A new road and river link between Timeri and Bartika. Commencements of work on the Parika to Goshen Road. Investment in key transformative infrastructure in the hinterland, region 10, 2, 6, and 9. Modernization of our community roads across all regions, an investment in hinterland and regional airstrips to boost our tourism product. 
already. On a bright side, we have been able in just six months to bring forward the approval of the new four-lane highway from Ogle to Eccles, funded by the Indian government by almost one year. Today we received the news that all the approval has been given in India and we are now moving to the procurement stage. This is a project that was delayed for almost seven years. Today, we are on the journey of accomplishing this and bringing relief to the people of Guyana. Human resources, building a world-class and highly skilled and literate population, investing in technical and vocational education, leading to international certification, creating opportunities for training, retra retraining and retooling of our human resource to meet the future demands of the economy, conducting a market-driven analysis as a basis on which our education system will be geared to ensure that there's a right match between educational output and economic output. On the positive side, we are in advanced stage of discussion to have our own Institute of Oil and Gas here in Guyana. In the area of technology, we will see the creation of a master plan for ICT development in Guyana. Investment in technology to improve our competitiveness, efficiency, transparency, and reliability. Moving government services towards a paperless environment. Ensuring every child leaves school computer literate. Investing in a patient care management system that will see every Guyanese connected through one card. Expanding access to internet services across all communities. Reduction in the cost of data to individuals and households. Increasing the number of persons using the internet from 36% by 100% by the end of our five year. Increasing the number of households having access to computer from 31% by 100% in five years. Investment in technology that will increase competitiveness in doing business and breaking down barriers. Investment in software development that will reduce time to processing construction permit, getting electricity and water connection by 50%. Important to all of this, We must have world-class social services. You will see public and private investment that will see world-class healthcare system acting as a net foreign currency earner for our country. Already, we have tremendous interest in this area. And I'm very delighted that many Guyanese are coming together in pursuing this interest also. You'll see specialized health care for maternity and children's services, comprehensive and reliable access to primary health care across every region, world-class educational facilities as intensifying private investment, building of sustainable communities in achieving the 50,000 house lots, <clears throat> commencement of a new, modern, sustainable secondary city. In addition to the provision of free university education during this term and the granting of 20,000 scholarships, you, you will also see this establishment of an internationally accredited oil and gas institute. 
<clears throat> investment will be made in training and increasing the quantity of educators while modernizing the curriculum, expanding the use of technology and improving educational facilities. The mix of new communities and infrastructure links will be geared towards reduction in traffic congestion, improvement in road safety, the physical security of our people, expansion of affordable homes, and quantum leap in the eradication of squatting. Investment in water resources to ensure 100% access by every community and expanded treated water coverage to at least 70% of the population. Direct investment and allocation will be placed in a national budget to support persons with disabilities. Direct investments and allocations will be made to support associations and organizations in our efforts to prevent cruelty against animals. Specific provisions will be made to support mental health and reproductive health. Important to the achievement of all these targets is a song stable and a song stable and viable macroeconomic framework. The aim is to create an environment that would ensure our competitive competitiveness, diversify the economy, support some monetary and fiscal policies, whilst enhancing transparency in a pro poor approach to growth and development. Whilst we're targeting high economic growth rate, this acceleration must, and I, and I emphasize, must be managed to minimize the risk of overheating. Our focus will be on maintaining exchange rate stability and managing inflation in lower single digits, rebuilding our depleted foreign reserves and diversification of new industries for large-scale large -scale plantation type agriculture, including aquaculture, among other things. I'm pleased to say that we have already managed to bring our livestock producers together. And with the enthusiasm, private investment and public investment, we anticipate that all the protein needs in the production of feed will be produced locally. All the corn, all the soybean. We will support businesses. We will support the private sector. We will support workers. Let me be clear. Every single worker, public sector workers, whether you're nurses, doctors, members of the judiciary, I assure you, by the end of our fifth year, not only will you be better off from a salary's perspective, but the benefits, the society in which you live, and the services that will be delivered to you will enable you to live a good life, a great life in Guyana. No more must the dream be to exit the shores. There is a bright future ahead. Let us embrace it. Let us support it. Dream big. Your government will support those dreams. Mr. Speaker, there is no end to the manifesto tasks that lie ahead. For there is no end to the efforts we must make for the homeland. We all want Guyana to be for each of us and for all of us and for the generations that will follow the best it can be. 
to build that home, it would not be right for us to forget or neglect our obligations beyond our shores. In the Caribbean community, in the Americas, in the world of small states and in global affairs. For we are not an island unto ourselves. We owe a special debt to CARICOM for helping to ensure that we could sit in this democratically elected parliament today. It is one we shall never forget as we work to build a Caribbean community worthy of the highest ideals of regional integration. Nor will we, nor will we be neglectful of members of the international community who kept vigil with us. Canada, the United States, the European Union, and the United Kingdom, among others, will honor their vigilance for us by joining them in pursuing the values of equality, of peace, and of the rule of law worldwide. Mr. Speaker, for too long, our country has been held ransom to the ambitions of partisan politics and the narrowness of partisan ambition. It is time to set those imposters aside and to embrace in their place the virtuous cause of patriotic duty, a commitment my government has made already. Guyana and the Guyanese people will deserve no less. They have endured enough. We are at a decisive moment in our history with a greater opportunity than previous parliaments to make our country a better place than it has ever been. This is the honor and challenge that time and events have laid at our door. We must, each of us, live up to it. The people of Guyana expect us to not spend our time squabbling and bickering. They want us to find common ground on which we can build a nation, in which they are safe and their children's future is secure. I pledge myself to that task. And I urge every representative in the National Assembly to join me in striving for its fulfillment. There can be no task more fulfilling, no task more honorable, no task more noble. Let us together run with endurance the race God has set before us. God bless you. God bless our beloved country. And may God bless our joint endeavors. I thank you.